Harvard Divinity School. Psychedelic Spirituality and Ancient Traditions, February 17th, 2024. This scholar challenges the faith of centuries, Christ and the sacred mushroom, which included a photo of John Marco Allegro uh, and a dried Amanita muscaria specimen. Then in April, extracts from the sacred mushroom were published in a serial in four parts. But even readers of the Sunday Mirror who experienced Allegro's thesis in micro doses earlier in the year would have been taken aback by his bold claim that Jesus was in fact a mushroom. The Dead Sea Scrolls scholar had certainly gained a reputation for stirring up controversy in the 1950s and 60s with bold claims about a crucified Messiah in Qumran and his decision to set out on an unconventional archeological expedition in which he led a team of amateurs on a treasure hunt for the hidden riches of the second temple. And it didn't help that Allegro often chose to take his bold claims straight to the public, often bypassing peer reviewed journals and presses in favor of newspapers, popular magazines, and trade books. Now, despite his reputation as a provocateur, Allegro had not made anything like the claim that Jesus was a mushroom in his publications prior to 1970. To the contrary, in many of his, of his earlier writings, Allegro regards Jesus as a historical figure who lived and breathed. So today, I'd like to explore the evolution of Allegro's thinking about Jesus throughout the mid-1960s and present as part of my argument some new archival evidence that I have come across in the United States and the United Kingdom. What we will find is that though on the surface it may seem that Allegro's bold thesis appeared all of a sudden, the sacred mushroom in the cross was actually years in the making. And I'll spend the remainder of my time today creating a timeline of Allegro's sacred mushroom in the cross. There's doubtless more to fill in in this timeline, but this is what at present I've been able to reconstruct. So let's start with the publication date of the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross and the Sunday Mirror articles um, and then work backward. Now, we'll need to move around a little bit in time uh, to fill in the rest of this timeline. At the John Rylands Library, I came across a letter that John Allegro wrote to William H. Brownlee on November 25th, 1968. Brownlee, as some of you may know, was a junior fellow in Jerusalem when the Dead Sea Scrolls came to light. He then became a professor at Claremont Graduate School and directed their Dead Sea Scrolls project until his retirement in 1982. Brownlee and Allegro had a correspondence that extended back to the 1950s, but in this particular letter from 1968, Allegro signs off by mentioning that, quote, for the past four years, I have been working intensively on other researches, which I hope will find first publication in 1970 here and in your country, the United States. Allegro was remarkably prolific, and in 1970 and 1971, he had published two books in addition to The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. Later in 1970, he published The End of the Road, a companion volume to The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, in which he contemplates whether Christianity has any continued relevance now that it has been shown definitively to be a cover story for an underground, underground drug cult. And in 1971, he published The Chosen People, a history of Judaism from the exile to the Bar Kokhba revolt. Though publication dates are not always easy for authors to anticipate, I find it highly unlikely that Allegro alludes to either of these two later books in his letter to Brownlee, since other sources confirm that it was the sacred mushroom rather than these other two books, which Allegro, a man who otherwise researched and wrote with great speed, spent years working on. Thus, from the Brownlee letter, we, gain, we learn that Allegro began work on the sacred mushroom in the cross in 1964, and that he submitted his manuscript to the publisher on October 23rd, 1968. A few months earlier, in July of 68, a very interesting exchange took place between uh, John Marco Allegro and the Bish Bishop James Pike, which I discovered in the archives at Syracuse. James Pike was a complex and compelling character. He was installed as Episcopal Bishop of California in 1958, but stepped down when faced with a heresy trial by his own church. Pike hosted Martin Luther King Jr. at Grace Cathedral following the March to Selma. He also published a book detailing seances he participated in to com uh, communicate with his deceased son. 
1969, one year after meeting and corresponding with John Allegro, he traveled with his new wife to Israel and embarked on an ill-fated trip to the Dead Sea, where he fell down a cliff and died. Pike was profiled by Joan Didion in her book, The White Album, and was fictionalized as Timothy Archer by the sci-fi novelist Philip K. Dick. What a life. Now, returning to the correspondence in June of 1968, Pike visited Allegro in Manchester for a conference. A letter from June 27th reveals that during the visit, he discussed Allegro's forthcoming book with him and even gave Allegro, quote, a mushroom book published by Doubleday. While Pike does not give the title of the book, my guess is that Pike gave him a copy of Andrea Puharish's The Sacred Mushroom, Key to the Door of Eternity, Doubleday, 1959. In this book, Puharish describes his association with a certain Harry Stone, a young sculptor known to slide into deep trances and speak in ancient Egyptian. While in a trance state, Harry Stone would identify himself as Ra-Hotep, a high-born Egyptian who lived 4,600 years ago and details secret and ancient mushroom rituals. This book claims to be nonfiction. Although Allegro nowhere mentions Puharish's book in his Sacred Mushroom in the Cross, I did find handwritten notes on the book among Allegro's papers in Manchester on the reverse of a typed page of what could well have been the transcript of Allegro's paper at that conference. I also spoke to James Pike's widow, uh, Pike's widow, Diane Kennedy, who confirmed that her husband likely recommended Puharish's sacred mushroom to Allegro. If Pike did in fact lend Allegro Puharish's book, then he may have played an active role in shaping some of Allegro's thinking about the mushroom and helped him arrive at the title for the sacred mushroom and the cross, which clearly echoes the title of Puharish's earlier book. On July 3rd, Allegro responded to Pike's letter, promising to return the Doubleday Mushroom book, which he found, quote, most stimulating, before reporting some unfortunate news. And I quote, after all the initial enthusiasm, someone in the publishers has taken fright, and a letter this morning regretfully decided against doing my book. A, nu a nuisance, really, is I haven't had the time or inclination to hawk it around, and I fear it's being compromised if the detailed synopsis is shown to too many people. Still, it's perhaps early days yet. Allegro then signs off with John, followed by a drawing of a little mushroom. <laughs> So we learned something that was not publicly known before, uh, before from this letter. Despite some initial enthusiasm, Allegro's publisher passed on the book. Someone at the press got cold feet. We might guess that the publisher that passed on the book was Doubleday, who published Allegro's previous four trade books. It's only logical that he would have approached Doubleday with the sacred mushroom and the cross. But it was not to be. In his letter to Pike, Allegro calls the rejection a nuisance, not because the sting of rejection, but because he does not have the time or willingness to take it to other presses. And he is also worried that his shocking thesis will be, quote, compromised if too many people see his book proposal. Clearly, in my opinion, for Allegro, regarding the, uh, guarding the shock value of his bold thesis outweighed his desire, desire for feedback from peers. We are left now only with a few dates from 1965 to 1967, through which we'll move chronologically. Beginning in December of 1965, there was a Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit at the British Museum. And on December 16, Allegro gave a lecture at the exhibit that received a great deal of press. Allegro sent, uh, set forth for the first time the argument that Jesus and the apostles were not real human beings, but mythological characters styled after Essene leaders from Qumran. He also declared with a certain optimism that the philological method could unlock the mystery of Christian origins. And during a BBC interview, a BBC radio interview in February of 1966, Allegro restated the same mythicist argument, but added that the New Testament is just a quote, covered document for the real truth, that the New Testament authors used wordplay to hide knowledge from the Romans. He also restated the promise of philology to unlock the real truth of Christian origins. So by late 65, Allegro had already arrived at the uh, three key ingredients for his sacred mushroom argument, uh, mythicism, 
the primacy of philology as a method for discovering the truth about Christian origins, and the New Testament as a, quote, cover document used to smuggle sectarian mushroom secrets past the Romans. But he had not yet, sorry, to smuggle sectarian secrets past the Romans, but he had not yet discovered mushrooms. The next important dates in our chronology are in March of 1967. On March 5th, Allegro gave a public lecture, presumably at the University of Birmingham. The next day, a certain psychiatrist named Dr. Bernard Barnett sent him a letter thanking him for the talk and enclosing an off-print of an article he'd published in the British Journal of Psychiatry entitled Witchcraft, Psychopathology, and Hallucinations. Barnett argued that the witch craze in the 16th and 17th centuries could have been due to the deliberate use of hallucinogenic drugs. Allegro responded two days later with enthusiasm. While this colorful letter is filled with a nascent version of the grand conspiracy theory he'd published in The Sacred Mushroom, of particular interest to us today is his confession that, quote, just recently it became evident that the number one drug to the Christians was the narcotic mushroom, particularly the Amanita muscaria. I should like to know, Allegro continues, more about the atropine-like drug that does the trick, but more than that at the moment is necessary to... More than that, at the moment, it is necessary to pin down the Semitic and Greek names under which this fungus was known. The most common is certainly the word underlying Peter, but there are others which are coming all too slowly, end quote. Allegro then apologizes for not being able to send in return a publication of his own on the topic, since, quote, my most recent work is still in the formative stage. Now, several aspects of this letter are of interest. First, while we don't find out where Allegro learned of the Amanita muscaria, we learn that he discovered the linchpin of his argument for the sacred mushroom just prior to this March 7th letter. Second, Allegro apparently arrived at this conclusion before doing almost any of the linguistic heavy lifting that runs throughout the sacred mushroom. At this point, he'd only unlocked the hidden meaning of Peter, the others, quote, coming all too slowly. It's almost impossible to interpret this letter as anything less than a conclusion in search of evidence. Allegro had discovered the mushroom. Now all he needed to do was find the linguistic evidence he needed to make the argument work. By October of the same year, Allegro had apparently found that evidence he was looking for. Since he teased the new argument, doubtless still thinking that Doubleday would publish it, in an October 13th announcement in the Daily Mail entitled, Drugs and the Christian Prophets. Allegro is careful not to show all of his cards. He does not mention the Amanita Muscaria, but he does venture that the biblical authors were on LSD or something like it. They had visions, he says. They went on a trip. The article also noted that Allegro was, quote, shortly to publish his new findings. As we now know, he wasn't. It'd be another two and a half years until Allegro's book would come out, and not with Doubleday, but with Hodder and Stoughton. Now, what, if anything, can we learn from these new materials and the timeline they enable us to reconstruct? For the sake of time, I'll state only briefly three important conclusions. First, it is sometimes said that Allegro got his idea for the sacred mushroom from the pioneering work of ethnomycologist Gordon Wasson, who wrote Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality. However, Wasson's book came out in 68, and as we now know, Allegro arrived at this theory in 67. Perhaps Allegro discovered mushrooms by reading Wasson's earlier 1957 photo essay in Life magazine entitled Seeking the Magic Mushroom, but it is clear that he arrived at his thesis for the sacred mushroom in the cross prior to the publication of Wasson's Soma. Second, Allegro's thinking on the early Jesus movement evolved over time. From the archival information, his pro uh, progression of thought becomes clear. He initially considered the early Jesus movement to be derivative of other Jewish movements. Then he pro progressed into mythicism, the de denial that they actually existed. And finally, he began to see the New Testament as a cover story of an underground drug cult with a particular affinity for the Amanita Muscaria. In light of this progression of thought, it is difficult to see, as many have, the full thesis in the sacred mushroom and the cross as a knee-jerk reaction to the religious abuses he may have suffered uh, from pious members of the early Dead Sea Scrolls team. 
Perhaps his initial impulse to see Christianity as derivative was motivated by an anti-Catholic impulse, but the grand mushroom theory took time for Allegro to develop. And finally, we cannot escape the impression from Allegro's letters, particularly from his letter to Dr. Barnett in March of 1967, that once Allegro discovered the Amanita muscaria, his research was no longer driven primarily by evidence. It did not help that Allegro seems to have done much of his work in isolation from other scholars, who could have urged him to exercise more caution in his philology. However, if the events of the 1950s are at all representative, feedback from peers would hardly have caused Allegro to pump the brakes on his grand mushroom theory. So after, uh, after all, Allegro was, in the words of his daughter and his biographer, the, quote, maverick of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is Anna Shirka, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Tel Aviv University, and she will be speaking on nuts and cannabis on shaping ecstasies. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here at Harvard Divinity School again. I wish to start with the general question, are we capable of conceptualizing a place of imagination or a place where the imagination is born? While neurobiologists and psychoanalysts propound to find its locus within the brain, the Jewish esotericists and specifically Kabbalists concluded that the chambers of someone's heart were the region privileged to contain the mystical Elan. Furthermore, they juxtaposed this idea with another idea, namely of optical delusion, called in Hebrew, achizat einaim, which means literally seizing the eyes, which was a kind of the vision of the divine glory, kavot, or a vision obtainable through the intermediary of demons. Pondering on the difference between genuine and illicit visions, we distinguish between attempts at encountering the Godhead in order to overcome the egotic self and consequently give up our own beingness in a quest to attain unity with the One. And this unity was sometimes called in Hebrew, achdut, the Oneness with the One, or as uh, Hasidic rabbi Shnur Zalman of Liadi claimed, or oh, many Hasidic rabbis, as is General Ten, in Bitul Hayesh. It is an absolute negation of the material existence, striping of wiles of materiality, but returning to the pre-Genesis nothingness, to the nothingness which was prior to any differentiation into a being, meaning God, and his creatures. Mm. At first glance, Kabbalistic writing seems to remain silent concerning the activators, possibly hallucinogens, eliciting the experience of altered states of consciousness. This apparent lacuna of psychedelic spirituality within Jewish esotericism and Kabbalah will be addressed in my today's presentation. The first part I called Son le nommé, without proper naming of psychoactive substances. A blurring of the dividing lines between hallucinogens and medical plants and spices is already inherent in the Hebrew designation sam, which indicates both drug medicine, a poison, as well as a fragrant spice. Sam harkens back to the Aramaic Syriac sama, signifying approximately the same drug, medicine, poison, and Assyrian shamu, bearing the meaning of plant, drug, or medicine. Moreover, in the stem of verb sime, we have samech and mem, two vowels, and this verb can be rendered as he blinded, on in the, or in the modern Hebrew, he dazzled. The noun sam has been incorporated into the name of archdemon, Samael, as well as uh, into the name of his, or partially translated, especially this meaning of he blinded or he dazzled, was a part of the name Lucifer, who transformed from a light-bringing morning star into a devil, 
Overcoming discrepancies between two seemingly opposite phenomena, here medicine and the poison, belongs to a typical Kabbalistic outlook, wherein the difference between two modes of implementation of the same fruit, plant or spice, is distinguished by its dosage, accurately mixing of the ingredients for every medical treatment, and the particular spiritual intention called kavana. The psychotic effects were triggered by the components of the sacred incense lit in the temple and called ktoret, composed of sweet spices, tacti, onica, frankincense, and galbanum. The qualities of galbanum, having been prized already by Pedanius Dioscorides in his Pharmacopoeia de Materia Medica, as a remedy for pains and inflammations, and if inhaled, were set to aid prevention of attack by poisonous beasts. According to Kabbalistic contemplation on incense, the galbanum was considered as the 11th space, meaning um, a space pertaining to Klippot, to the demonic forces within the Kabbalistic universe. From the angle of contemporary medicine and neurobiology, other plants and spices mentioned in esoteric and Kabbalistic writings may also be classified as stimulants used to obtain trance-like conditions. I wish to focus on one among them, namely the so-called marking nut, known in medical manuals as baladur, or in Latin, semicarpus anacardianum, in Arabic, habab el ferm not of apprehension. And we are able to see these particular nuts. The designation, it's baladur, is derived from Sanskrit term balataka, meaning like a spear, and alludes to the fruit heart like shape together with its capacity to deeply permeate into body tissues. For that reason, it was commonly deployed in Ayurvedic medicine. We know the description of al Jazar for using Baladur as a remedy for forgetfulness, and however, if overdosing it, it could turn into the fatal drug, causing madness and serious sicknesses. Ergo, an emphasis has to be set on an overstimulation with Baladur, euphemistically described as a kind of psychosis, which de facto can be identified as an expanded state of consciousness or a sudden mystical revelation, a meditative state, or out-of-body experience. Let us ruminate upon a passage from Midrash Hanelam, mystical or concealed Midrash, in which this drug has been described. I wish to quote, Rabbi Hiskia said, I was in the regions of Arabs and saw men who used to conceal themselves among cliffs, in caves among the mountains, but every Sabbath Eve they would return to their homes, I inquired of them, what is that you do? They replied, we are hermits and we engage in Torah every single day. Sometimes we eat only wild herbs. I asked them, what with are you nourished at other times? They replied, in the desert, we find trees sprouting acorns and we eat them. When the teaching illuminates us in great joy, some of us sleep away, cook them and we eat. Such a day is recounted by us as especially good. When the trees do not sprout, we eat whatever herbs we can find. We cook them and we eat." End of quotation. Rabbi Hiskia was one of the closest companions of Tanaitic sage active in the second century of the common era, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who is the major figure in Zohar. And he recalls his encounter with Hermes dwelling in Arabia's caves, paying specific heed to the nutrition. Pointedly, the phrase trees sprouting acorns is located in the textual variant preserved in the manuscript Vatican 428 on folio 100b as the Mitzmaha Balna, sprouting Balna, which is de facto a corrupted, a corrupted term for Balut or with Dalet or Tet, which is in turn an abbreviation of the full name of this drug, Baladur. The aesthetics engaged in Torah confirmed ingesting the murking not only if encountering exegetical obstacles while sojourning in the desert. Periods of Baladur consumption were perceived as time of the spiritual illuminations, bringing not only delight, tavata, in this world, but furthermore, arousing a wish to participate in the supernal joy in the world to come. The Kabbalist 
prized such a yearning for the divine for the day of Balna intake was recognized as particularly good by referring to the same formula, Kitov, which sealed each step in the creation account in Genesis. To reach above and beyond, the opening of ascetic minds hinges upon reinforcement of the faculties, a transposition from the habitual understanding of the scripture achieving over the course of their studies to mystical capacity to comprehend God's wonders. Wonders encompassing previously unfathomable secrets, for example, the secret of the nut, the secret of the mystical unity described by many esotericists. Moreover, the adjective tov amounts to 17th, and in the Jewish numerological technique, it would mean there is the same amount like nut, a goss. I wish to mention that the term balut was replaced in some of Zoharic manuscripts with term kulna, meaning everything. And in the first printed of edition of Zohar Hadash, the Saloniki 1597 on folio 11b, the same happened. In other, in other part of the Zoharic manuscripts, we have also the entire narrative about the Hermes arised. So it was completely cut off. We discern here a kind of the internal censorship. However, we know that a mixture called Baladur Katan was already strongly recommended by medieval sages in Provence for reaching so-called Ptichat Lev, opening of the heart, a state of subconsciousness facilitating memorization. I wish now to speak about so-called profane illuminations. So the basic question is, does the usage of psychoactive substances eclipse mystical dimensions of deepened consciousness and ecstatic feelings of spiritual bliss? In our words, in other words, do hallucinogens necessarily turn sacred spiritual ecstasy into a profane illumination? Here, I wish to speak on two uh, different sources, namely on Joseph Leib in Mardachia's journey to discover the ancient wisdom of cannabis Torah and on Walter Benjamin Hashish protocols. Lurking within the mechanics of radical polysemy of pharmacon, implying both medicine and a poison, in Plato's Phaedrus, Derrida allows us to trace the transference from a non philosophem into a philosophem, which is to realize a pharmacon, which is not longer epitomized by samim, but medicaments or toxins, but which is a power of reallocation of logos, a legitimation for mythos. Does the mind concern here may be viewed as a validation for the writings of the secrets and their dissemination and a subsequent creation of the specific law of ecstasies? In Hasidic cannabis, the ancient and emerging Torah of Drugs, Memoir, Josef Leib Mardachia uh, described his pursuit to justifying marijuana usage in, within spiritual realm of Judaism. The religious motivation for the consumption of cannabis is reinforced not only through sitting wake passages from Torah and Talmud, which, which possibly hint at permissible use of intoxicants, but moreover by evoking the teaching of countercultural icon Rabbi Shlomo Karlebach, who encouraged cannabis smoking among his disciples. Another cornerstone for the Torah of Drugs, according to Mardachia, was laid by Rabbi Nachman of Breslau, in his ritual of smoking the pipe, as well as by the, by the Izbisa Hasidim. The entire memoir oscillates between a romantic longing for reconciliation of drug, of drug usage with the Jewish religious outlook, rebellious attitude of a young yeshiva student marveling at American pop culture, and a joke-like style of storytelling. He, the climax of his mystical experience of marijuana trance was described as a vision of concentric cycles with cycles within the cycles, which is a reminiscent of Jewish mystical visions. There are many similarities between him and Walter Benjamin, especially the common ground can be established by otherworldly sensitization to sounds, a meditative sound of nigunim, color, distortion in perception of space and time, oddness of embodiment, simultaneous estrangement, and openness to the other. 
I wish to conclude with maybe much more general uh, observation, which is related to the philosophical outlook, namely the Greek term ecstasis denotes a displacement, be it a mental or physical motion, out of a proper place, or placement outside the assigned dwelling. Such a displacement occurred in all the experiments described, both at Benjamin, uh, at Mardachia, as well as in the case of hermits. Then this kind of the displacement morphed into introspection of an enstasis, a self-exploration, and revealed a subtle call of uncanniness, which was called by uh, Heidegger's Unheimlichkeit. And here I wish to quote Heidegger's uh, short ruminations, which is his translation of the first call of Antigone. Manifold is the uncanny, today non, yet nothing uncannier than man bestirs itself, rising up beyond him. End of quote. Heidegger's notion of uncanniness underscored the defamilization of the human being, his feeling of strangeness of being out of home in the ambiguity of forms and processes, a progression of disclosure and subsequent withdrawal of being into itself. Uncanniness is also the phenomenon running over the language. In my excursus on Kabbalistic hallucinogens, specifically on Mardachias and Benjamin intoxication trials, I stress shifts in the mechanics of perception, a quest for pure impersonal consciousness competing with the unique intensity of bodily sensations, both marvelous and horrifying at once, which is denoted by Todeinon. Uncanny facet of the experience centers around the incommunicable nature of spiritual voyages and profane illuminations in the tissue of language, thereby placing it in accordance with the law of logos, which appears an, an, as an all-regulating force. Even a temporal escape from the logic of logos into a joyful trance only reinforces its validity, assigning mystical experience its placement with him the, re the realm of ineffability, Unzakbarheit. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Um, our final speaker on this panel is Finian Garrity, who is a visiting assistant professor of religious studies at Brown University. And Finian will be speaking on the Soma question, Vedic traditions and the historiography of psychedelics. Thank you, Finian. Well, thank you so much, Charles. Uh, and thanks to the organizers and all the volunteers who've made the day go so smoothly. And thanks to all of you for um, making it to the end of this fulfilling day. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you uh, tonight about uh, Soma. Historical narratives tell us as much about ourselves and modernity as they do about societies and cultures of the past. And the grand story of psychedelics in the ancient world is no exception. To reveal these retrojections into the past, we have to grapple with history itself as the object of inquiry. And historiography is the study of how history is constructed. So today I pose the question, what is Soma? To reflect on the historiography of psychedelics in relation to Vedic traditions of early India. Sanskrit Vedas. Founding texts of Hinduism document the sacramental use of soma, a ritual drink pressed from a plant of the same name, said to confer power, inspiration, and immortality, as well as access to altered states and divine visions. And the idea of soma has animated Western investigations of psychoactive plants and fungi for more than a century. The main concern of psychonauts, ethnobotanists, philosophers, and historians alike has been Soma's botanical identification. Although, as Wendy Doniger observed already in 1968, the effort to identify the Soma plant has resulted in considerably more confusion than clarification. My primary aim today is historiographic critique. 
I'll show that the array of candidates proposed for the authentic soma of Vedic India has neatly tracked trends in the drug zeitgeist of the 20th century. The soma of the past, it seems, is entangled with pharmacological and psychedelic knowledge of the present. To conclude, I'll consider how scholarship might respond to this critique, highlighting two paths for future research. Soma in Vedic tradition is a male god, a plant, and a ritual beverage. Known by the epithet Amrita, Soma is the elixir of immortality. And you can compare uh, another Indo-European tradition, uh, the Greek ambrosia. Instituting sacrifices with Soma as the sacrament, the gods first gained immortality. Following suit, humans undertook their own sacrifices where Soma was pounded, sprinkled with water, pressed with stones to extract the juice, strained through a filter made of sheep's wool, and then mixed with milk, honey, or barley. The word Soma, derived from the Sanskrit verb to press, refers to this ritual preparation. Brahmin priests drank Soma in rounds, punctuated by mantra recitation, chanting, and fire offerings. The oldest religious poetry of India, the Rig Veda, contains many hymns that mention Soma. And these poems don't tell us much about Soma botanically beyond referring to stalks, stems, and knots, and the yellowish red hue and bitter taste of its flowing juice. Mythologically, they describe Soma as a source of energy, strength, and poetic inspiration. He defends against hatred, evil, and misfortune. He's a panacea, curing the sick and healing the lame. But Vedic Soma is best known to modernity for its invigorating, ecstatic, and even visionary effects. Let me share a few stanzas in Doniger's translation. Like impetuous winds, the drinks have lifted me up. Have I not drunk Soma? The drinks have lifted me up like swift horses bolting with a chariot. Have I not drunk Soma? One of my wings is in the sky. I have trailed the other below. Have I not drunk Soma? I am huge, huge, flying to the cloud. Have I not drunk Soma? And most memorably, we have drunk the Soma. We have become immortal. We have gone to the light. We have found the gods. With testimony like this, it's no wonder that the search for the original Soma continues. These days, the Soma sacrifice is still performed by the Brahmin priesthood in parts of India, legacy of a continuous tradition stretching back to the first millennium BCE. However, already in the ancient period, as Brahmins migrated from the northwest of the Indian subcontinent to the east and south, they seem to have substituted other plants. The soma of today probably does not derive from the same plant as it did in antiquity. This, uh, the soma substitutes used now may be mildly toxic, possibly narcotic, and feature in traditional Indian medicine. In 20th century scholarship, the candidates put forward for the true soma number more than 100. Let me review the most prominent of these in chronological sequence. Where relevant, the slides will mention the psychoactive constituents at work. Evoking the Indo-European past, Soma in the 19th century was explained as an Indian substitute for mead, an alcoholic drink made from fermented honey. The word mead is related to the Vedic name for Soma, madhu, sweet. Around the same time, evidence from the cognate Iranian tradition of Hauma suggested that ephedra was a likely match. Soon alcohol joined the ranks, beer from barley or dates, wine from grapes. However, James McHugh's latest work on the history of drink in South Asia rules out alcohol as soma. In the 1920s, cannabis in various forms gained attention, especially bhang, a preparation of milk and parts of the cannabis plant still consumed in India today. By the 1950s, several plants in the ephedra genus came back on the radar. Ephedra has long been the favored candidate for Soma of many leading historians of early South Asia. R. Gordon Wasson's arguments for the fairy tale mushroom, Amanita muscaria, 
circulated widely in the 1960s based on parallels with Siberian shamanism. This was in the wake of Wasson's vaunted discovery of psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico and the birth of ethnomycology. Starting in the 1970s, Soma was linked to psilocybin mushrooms. Terence McKenna famously argued for the psilocybin cubensis, citing its visionary quality. Syrian rue, Peganum harmala, garnered support in the late 1980s on the basis of pre-modern Iranian halma rituals. Rue contains harmine and harmaline, both of which may be so psychoactive in their own right. When combined with other plants, they also help to trigger the psychedelic effects of DMT. And this exact biochemical combination undergirds Amazonian ayahuasca. So even though South America is a long way from India, uh, scholars starting in the 2000s argued that an ayahuasca analog could have been made from Indian flora and that this combination might have been soma. And Matthew Clark's 2017 book makes this case. Still another plant combination suggested in the 1990s was the opium poppy, cannabis, and ephedra, traces of which have been reported together in the late Bronze Age Bactriana Margiana archaeological complex in Central Asia. And this gets at a fundamental problem of uh, the history of Vedic traditions, which is that we have a lot of textual testimony, but very little material culture that's accepted to be relevant to the tradition, which kind of excludes archaeology from this conversation to some degree. Now, uh, the scholar who has provided the impetus for my historiographic critique today is James McHugh, a historian of alcohol and drugs. McHugh engages Soma in a thought-provoking epilogue to his recent book on alcohol in South Asia. His bottom line, every age has the Soma it deserves or desires. So let's review. Alcohol and cannabis from the 20s to the 50s, then various mushrooms in the trippy countercultural 60s and 70s, the stimulant ephedra in the speedy white powder 80s, <laughs> giving way to plant combinations uh, involving DMT from the 90s forward as the so-called psychedelic renaissance reaches full flower. So what we have here is a roll call of psychoactive substances in the 20th century, formed by the increasing openness towards drugs in Euro-American culture, the expansion of academic knowledge, and global market forces. Scholarship made great advances during this period in the ethnobotany, ethnomycology, philology, and archeology span of early South Asia. Yet it seems that the more we learn from these disciplines, the less sure we become of what Soma was or might be. Soma has become a floating signifier of the Ur psychedelic. And since many of these plants and fungi have different constituents and divergent cultural histories, this historiographic critique may even call into question catch-all categories like psychedelics or entheogens. So where do we go from here? Going forward, I think we should shift our gaze away from botany back towards Soma's primary domain, ritual. Recall that the plant's whole profile stems from its ritual preparation. And so by way of conclusion, let me propose two paths for future study, both rooted in ritual culture. And in case you're wondering, I'm, I'm not gonna be trotting out any kind of new theory of what Soma was, <laughs> more of ways we might proceed. Uh, our first path leads to modern India. Nambudri Brahmins in the southern state of Kerala continue to perform Soma sacrifices today. And scholars over the past 50 years, uh, myself included, have argued that their traditions of mantra and sacrifice are in fact quite archaic, matching ancient texts and rites. And there's ample evidence overall for substantial continuity with a deep past. Not enough attention has been paid, however, to the Nambudri Soma sacrament per se, including the handling of the substituted plant, ritual preparations and implements, and the phenomenology of Soma drinking among the priests. So even if the plant currently in use is not psychoactive, 
the traditional praxis of ritual preparation, which has been handed down over the centuries, could shed light on the broader question. Instead of trying to fit Soma into a prefabricated academic discourse, this line of inquiry centers the materiality and aesthetics of ritual performance. Our second path returns to ancient India. The Rig Veda, which I quoted, is regarded as the, the most important source for studying Soma because it directly discusses the plant, the drink, and its effects on consciousness. Yet there is a neglected source from a century or two later that should also be consulted. And this is the Sama Veda, consisting of melodic chants that are performed exclusively during the pressing and drinking of Soma. Some Samavedic chants incorporate Rig Vedic verses by breaking up, extending, repeating, and distorting their words, transforming meaningful poetry into nonverbal sequences of vocal sound. But the most intriguing chants do not use Rig Vedic material at all. Instead, they consist of what musicologists call non-lexical vocables phonemes and utterances with no semantic meaning. So here's an example rendered into written text. Ova, 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 humba, ova. So I think we should take seriously the idea of Samavedic chants as vocal traditions that have shaped and been shaped by the Soma sacrifice. Samaveda was the soundscape of the Soma experience sung while the priests were drinking Soma and feeling its effects. We might speculate further that these chants were not just performed, but composed under the influence of Soma. And this could be a point of departure for cross-cultural comparison with other vocal traditions formed in analogous ways. For instance, non-lexical vocables predominate in both the peyote songs of the Native American church and some of the ayahuasca prayer songs of Amazonian shamanism. On another level, traditional practitioners throughout the Americas report a high incidence of non-semantic phonemes in the speech and songs of the otherworldly entities they meet on their psychedelic journeys. So perhaps this is how spirits communicate. We may never be able to conclusively answer the question, what is Soma? in botanical terms. Nonetheless, we should continue to find new ways to engage with the text, culture, and experiences this immortal plant has engendered. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Finn. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jeff. We have 20 minutes for conversation, for questions. Ginger has volunteered to hand out a microphone. Um, I see a hand up in the far back in the black. We'll start there. Uh, thank you. I have a question in terms of uh, Soma um, relationship to or like the benefits of thinking Soma um, in the cultural construct of masculinity, because it's performed mostly among men, and uh, also like gaining strength and yeah, certain things. So it will be interesting to know more. And thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if I have a live mic. Oh, let's turn your mics on. Okay, check. Hello, thank you. Yeah, it's a great observation because we've been talking about uh, gender of some of these divinities and, and entities all day to some extent. And yes, Soma, not only is it a male uh, deity and kind of masculine plant, but it's embedded in a highly patriarchal tradition um, in which, in fact, if we're talking about ritual, only one woman is per permitted in the ritual space, the wife of the patron of the sacrifice. Um, so it's an important question to ask and to wrestle with. Um, there's maybe one attestation of Soma as, as female, but that's uh, unusual in the Rig Veda. And then uh, in a pretty famous article by uh, Cal Watkins, who was a, a Harvard pianist, um, 
he refers to, um, I think my mic's gone out, but I, I can speak pretty loudly, so. Um, he, okay, good, thank you. Uh, he refers to, um, Thanks. Uh, he, he notes that although Soma is a male deity in, in sketching out its Indo-European background, uh, it's often personified in the company of uh, female entities, right? So he kind of theorizes that there's this kind of uh, male deity that is administered by, he suggests, some kind of uh, female um, practitioner, right? Uh, that's, a, that's an argument based on poetics, and it's pretty hard to tease kind of real world conclusions out of that, but I think it's a, a really great point you make. Other questions? Yes, right here. This is a question for Anna. Um, thank you so much for bringing that Midrash Elam text. Um, and I'm curious, two things. One, have you encountered any other sources of a, of a similar period to, the, to that Midrash which would intimate some kind of familiarity with the utilization of different plant-based compounds for interacting with different deeper levels of engagement with a primary religious practice like Torah study. So that's one. And then the second one is, how many more texts do you feel like there are in which intimate or like want to say that Torah itself is the substance rather than it needing to, there needing to be some kind of augmenting intermediary substance which brings the deeper significant meaning and rather that Torah but engaged with on its multi-leveled interpretive hermeneutical process is actually um, the drug they seek. So you can answer one or both or whatever. First of all, yes, you are able to hear me now. Uh, okay, thank you very much for both questions. They are both very interesting. First of all, I'm starting with Midrash Kanelam, which is the source from the 13th century, written in the pseudo-epigraphic style as the entire Zoharic corpus, per se, Hebrew Aramaic. And here, it is very interesting to see the the entire, uh, both the entire structure as well as uh, the development, because not in every single manuscript Balna is mentioned, as I um, spoke about it, sometimes it's come out at Skulna as everything, which is without specification. They are manuscripts in which, like I think Kazana Tenze, it would be the one manuscript which has no mention of Balut in any event. And uh, other sources would be especially magical recipes and so-called Kabbalah Masid, therefore practical Kabbalah. However, we have many medical sources investigated, especially by Professor Harit Boss of the University of Cologne, who wrote a specific paper dedicated to use of marking nut, called also marsh nut, Baladur. And he um, found out uh, many other sources, especially medical sources. Therefore, it would be very interesting to retrace it back from the medieval period through the uh, entire um, trajectory of the pre-modern use. For example, Zakuto in, in Shurashe Shemot mentioned also this type of drug and uh, Vital in Lurianic Kabbalah in Sefa Peulot, which is also called Sefa Refuot, which means the book of practices, Peulot, Peula, or Refua, which means the book of medicines. Therefore, we have the entire corpus of magical recipes, and it would be the first place uh, when we can look at Segulot specifically. It was partially done by Professor Yuval Harari from the Ben Gurion University, who looked at sources related to Ptichat Lev, to opening of heart. Therefore, there is a part of research. However, Dalonzano in, in his Marich, so also uh, pre-modern source, uh, source, discuss it in general as an entry in a quasi-lexicon. Moreover, the second question is, uh, yes, Torah itself can, can be seen as a kind of drug, which is really a playful. Uh, 
explanation on the meta-linguistic level. However, mm, uh, yes, Torah was also perceived as Malbush, as a vile. Therefore, it is mm, the double travel sometimes because the reality became accessible only through different vials, which means through the Malbushim, to reach the moment when we will be able to approach to the Godhead itself. It's just to go through many veils and also through many states of apprehension, through many states of better understanding, governing higher mystical elevation. And, but per se, this idea of this play of Torah as a drug and learning Torah as a particular drug to, uh, to better understanding of our reality uh, was also deployed by the author of the Hasidic cannabis, by Mardachia himself. Thank you. I want to ask a question. I, I, we have plenty of time, so I think I can. Um, <clears throat> it's a question for you, Jeff. So uh, since Allegro's um, explosive hypothesis, there has been some recent attention to uh, psychedelics and Christian origins. Um, has anyone engaged with Allegro's thesis in anything more than a dismissive tone? Has anyone tried to um, engage it seriously? Uh, I can't recall whether Brian Marescu mentions it at all in his book, the, S the Immortality Key, the second half of which is about um, psychedelics and Christian origins. Um, I'm not sure on Marescu either. Um, and then there's the book by the Browns. Mm -hmm. Um, what I have, what I've not seen is a sustained engagement with it. What, what I have seen are people citing him for the sort of general thesis and then building upon that in their own unique way. So what we don't have is a sustained, sustained dialogue with Allegro. Uh, at least not in scholarly or para-scholarly sources. And to me, I think that is the part that's the most distressing. Um, not because I'm particularly persuaded by Allegro, but I think he certainly merits our attention. There's been a, with the resurgence of popularity of um, Allegro's book recently outside of academia, in part due to Joe Rogan, um, <laughs> I mean, he's uh, Allegro's on Rogan's recommended reading list. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, what we have seen are a couple of academic think pieces that have come out, which have essentially argued that Allegro, that Allegro was wrong, that Jesus was not a mushroom. And I keep coming back to the idea that, you know, for academics, We've invested, or institutions have invested, in many cases, millions of dollars in our education. We can surely come up with a better response than no, Jesus was not a mushroom. <laughs> and so what, I, what I'm attempting in this project, and I don't know if it's gonna be that successful, um, is to enter into a dialogue with Allegro. And if you'll allow me just uh, one second uh, longer here on this, it's a, a bit of a, a tangent here, but I think it's important. Uh, Rather than, I guess I can say that, I have tenure now, so I can say this. We, we don't know Jesus was not a mushroom. <laughs> well, be before I get applause. That's what everyone was waiting to hear. <laughs> because when, in, 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 in the humanities, especially when, we, when we're dealing with ancient history, we're dealing with the balance of probabilities. Right. And what I can confidently say is that for me, given the principles of history that I work with, the balance favors Jesus being a flesh and blood human rather than a mushroom. However, something tipped the scales for Allegro. And I'm curious what that was. And I'm wondering if we can use that rebalancing of the scales um, um, done by Allegro to, 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 to think about what the limits of our discipline are and to take a moment to reflect on whether those limits have been set in the right place. Great, thank you. Yes, there's two questions right here. Thank you. 
since you have tenure. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Might I suggest researching if uh, God was just a really friendly drug dealer? All right. <laughs> I think that wasn't a question. Yeah, that wasn't a. How about a question? Oh, oh okay. Um, I this this question. Uh, although I am quite amused by the possibility that Jesus could have been a mushroom, or that mushrooms are Jesus um, in terms of the metaphysical energy. Um, my question is for Professor Goretti um, about uh, if there's any known relationship between soma and Egyptian traditional medicine, particularly given the use of the latter um, in terms of like combinations of psychoactive substances and the similarity of some of those substances um, to descriptions of some of the plants used in the preparation of soma. Um, just if you had any insight yeah. into that, I'm very curious. No, I, I haven't heard of um, any connections except very kind of um, gestures towards Egyptian culture and history. So the, the late 19th century theory that Osoma was maybe a, a barley beer would refer to kind of Egyptian examples of producing alcohol, but um, those are not taken very seriously now as a kind of botanical candidate for Soma. Um, and since we're talking about balance of probability, it seems pretty low, uh, even though the ancient world was, you know, more interconnected than, and we're discovering that more and more every day. But even so, it seems pretty low that there would have been any kind of direct influence or contact in um, kind of late Bronze Age uh, Central Asia with Egyptian uh, medicine and magic. You know, it would have had to, if 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 there was such an influence, it would have been had had to be kind of highly mediated, right? So, so most studies of soma that look at kind of cultural influence that might come from outside the Indian subcontinent focus on the most the closest geographic, linguistic, and religious cognate. Um, you know, related tradition, which is the uh, Avestan tradition, uh, the roots of Zoroastrianism and kind of early Iranian tradition. And so I was referring to that when we were talking about the Halma substitute. Um, so I'd say the consensus among scholars now, even though we still don't know, uh, is that the solution will lie in a very close comparison of uh, Soma of Vedic India and Halma of pre-modern Iran. I think we'll take one more question because um, we want to have a break before the, set, the our final keynote. So, um, Chardé. Thank you. This is a question for Finian. I was wondering, in your work, have you met anybody who has like deep phytognostic knowledge of Ayurvedic plants and has asked the plants if any of them, or the mushrooms, if any of them are Soma, or if they know who Soma was. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't met such a person or, had, or, had, or queried anyone in that way. But, you know, culture tradition has a way of communicating kind of diffusely and broadly, and the Soma Lata, the Soma Creeper in Ayurvedic medicine um, is almost always one of the Asclepiads or Sarcostema. So in that respect, in, insofar as that represents a kind of gradual consensus of what Ayurvedic tradition feels Soma is, it would be uh, one of the Sarcostema <coughs> plants. You know? um, but maybe I can take this opportunity too for, for, the, for the group, uh, Charles, if I can. Sure. One question that is in my mind about this whole panel is what is it about the appeal to tradition and the past that's so important in psychedelic studies and, and history, right? Because I think it's, it has more to do with, oh, I really want to know what that substance was. There's something else that we're all thirsting for in kind of um, looking for that, right? And asking that, that question in a million different ways. So it's a little unorthodox, but I don't know if my fellow panelists have anything <laughs> to say about that. Good question. That point, yeah. I'll just say for Allegro, it was kind of, it was a very different enterprise. Um, he um, obviously linked uh, uh, antiquity with authority, um, like many of us do. But what he was trying to do with that book is, is, is level a devastating critique of Christianity by cutting it off at its root. And so he, as I mentioned, was not a psilocybin enthusiast. Uh, didn't even smoke. His daughter tells me he wouldn't allow onions or strawberries even on the dinner table. 
because they upset his stomach. Um, and he was someone who never wanted to lose control of himself. He loved control. Uh, and so I think for him, he was trying to put an end to Christianity by dismissing it as a drug cult. So there was a sort of intersection of like um, antiquity and, um, you know, a, a sort of drug, a, a sort of uh, encyclopedic knowledge of drugs, but it worked in a very different way for him. If I still could add something, I would say that it's very important also to discern how maybe small and maybe less important than we would assume was the difference between what is a poison and what is a medicine. And especially in this interplay that the same substance can be seen on, on one side as a medicine and if overdosing it, it could be uh, changed into a fatal drug. And that both are not necessarily counting for something which was seen as illicit substance at that period. It was very typically used. It was just habitual usage of this type of plant, spice, etc. Et it was absolutely another perception of drugs and what we understand today under the term drug. And that this negative denomination that drug is something which needs to be just punished as the countercultural movement, is absolutely absent from ancient traditions or medieval thinking. And that only later a kind of greater censorship and a kind of rethinking of what is medicine, how the medicine may be composed and what is illicit substance and what may be still allowed within the confines of the medicine as a greater science emerged. But at the beginning, it was absolutely absent, I would say. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Finn, for that great uh, question at the end. We are at uh, 5.15. Uh, Professor Carl Hart will be uh, giving the final keynote lecture in this room in 15 minutes. So uh, let's take this opportunity to stretch our legs, take a break, and we'll be back here in 15 minutes. Let's thank our final panel. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.